Hey everyone, welcome back. Uh, Cache 3. So, like all of you, I'm also kind of already clicked into the next thing, so I'm going to make this uh, lecture pretty fast, which I'm hoping is going to mean it's going to be under a half an hour, maybe more like an hour. Um, first of all, y'all are killing it with these responses to this cache or cache or whatever you want to call it. Um, they're so good. They're so thoughtful. And I commend all of you for the amount of um, writing and research and the way that you're going about doing both of those things uh, is really, it's, it's awesome. It's really nice to, to hear that you're so engaged with these ideas because um, I've taken a different approach this term or with this syllabus this year in doing these caches um, in lieu of just having a written response or like a, a blog roll of ideas. And it seems to be really working because you're connecting ideas to readings and artists to films and kind of playing around with how you make connections. And that is going to serve you really well moving forward um, through the next couple of terms. Um, because also the next class that I that we're in the spring, our spring class on value, is going to shift slightly as well. Um, so uh, also just want to make a few notes about the final assignment. Um, Sarah had was asking me, and thank you very much, Sarah, again, for your question, because I'm sure other people are having this, like, um, this confusion of what am I supposed to be doing right now. And so the easiest way that I can explain the final assignment is, um, or the easiest way that I can explain how you should be structuring this final assignment is actually in these caches. So um, I think the one that was the most kind of succinct was the one on uh, Islamic feminism. So the decision in choosing the artists, um, the, the work, and the literature, all of it had to do, all of it had to serve the same thesis. That, um, and that thesis being, in order to understand at a pedagogical level the structure of identity politics, it makes sense to designate one very specific identity and therefore coordinate a collection of very specific artwork that played with it within that identity. And that identity was not just feminism uh, or feminisms, uh, i.e. female identity slash female imagery, the, the image female body, um, but also in order to make it even more specific, because there's so many ways that we can talk about feminism, was to talk about it specifically um, in a place in the world where it's con where it is actually um, very radically developing. And so I, I made the selection that these artists could tell this story very well. And then in staging that cache, I, obviously you're going to give me more information. So what I did was just kind of make a list that <clears throat> pretty much went chronologically through those artists, excuse me. And so the difference for you all, and this is important to note, the difference in structure between just having this list of, of things um, is that I would like for you to establish conversations between the works. So if you have, say, a David Altmed work and you also have a Yoga Lala performance, how are you going to interact? How are you going to make those works interact in a space so that they say a, the specific thing you want them to say? Is your conversation about David Altmed's work, as is in this conversation today, um, having to do with his assistance? In that case, does it make sense to even have a work of his in the space? I don't know, maybe not. What would a Julie Maritou wall piece feel like? Um, and, oh, excuse me, I can't remember who actually brought up the uh, comparison between Julie Maritou and Saul Lewitt because that was awesome. Um, because Saul Lewitt also uses a lot of, um, of assistance in the production of his work. And I'm using his name as, and his authorship in the present tense because we are still 
developing Salawit works. So his, even though he's passed away, we're still kind of continuing his conversation and his uh, authorship <clears throat> in a really interesting way. But anyway, that was a good one. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so I've lost my train of thought. So I'll just back up a little bit and say that the major distinction between your cache and or your final assignment and the caches that I've been putting up this term is that you need to develop spatial relationships. Now, Sarah's question was, do I need to make up a gallery? That's not necessarily the case, but um, because I think that's going to take you a little bit farther outside of the conversation within the work, and that's the thing I want you to focus on. I have, um, and you might have talked to other students in the college, but I have for other classes made students, um, and I've had you actually pretend like it was a specific space. Um, that's not the instance here. The, for this project, please just um, say that this work is relative to this work and it puts these two artists in conversation to serve this thesis that I have stated. Now, the writing component, um, when I said that it was kind of half curatorial essay, half grant proposal, think of that more as a recipe and less of a map in that sense that these two ideas, those two realms should be commingled at the end of the essay. In other words, don't have half, like one page of your written assignment be a grant proposal and then one page of your written assignment be a curatorial essay. Make them be one thing. What does that read like? It reads as a combination between an actual experience of the work, how many artworks you're going to have, where they're placed, what it feels like to be in that space, versus the kind of conceptual piece that is a curatorial practice. So it's going to be both phenomenological and ontological. And on that, we're going to start talking about how performative um, these works are, how collaborative these works are, and how dialogical these works are. And I can do it um, in a short amount of time. Loop. Okay. Michael Malachek. Uh, this guy is doing really interesting things. Um, I've never, I've not had the ability to see his performances live, but I have. Um, I also didn't go and see the show It or It, as you all have really wonderfully. Uh, analyzed and critique. There's almost nothing to say about this cache, actually. Um, at the end of the day, you know, I my notes are uh, to this end that this conversation is about materials as collaborators, but also materials as performers. And so I, A, I've decided to put this guy up front so that the idea of objects as a performer could be at play, but also this idea that everything becomes a performance could be in your in your mind as you move through these projects. And as far as the responses that have been posted online to this point, you all have really hit the nail on the head with how you're approaching this work. Um, my favorite detail is that so many of you have latched on to the fact that there's this, this scent is a part of this work. Um, olfactory sensation is definitely a very contemporary consideration for artists and I, I don't think it's surprising that it's coming out of or that we are coming out of or we are in the midst of I should probably say a kind of food revolution and so we're considering what we taste and what we eat as a part of an extension of life and after the collaborative and performance performative works of someone like Rick Richter Vinaja, who makes big pad thai dinners and gallery spaces. Scent is definitely a part of artwork now. Um, and I thought it was very <clears throat> spot on that so many of you latched onto that. Um, the way that I was going to talk about his work or the, the reading that I was going to associate this work with was Alan Caprow. Um, specifically, the way that Caprow discusses how we move from Jackson Pollock, modernism on a wall, painting style, to something that is performative, collaborative, installation-based, 
sculptural, but also kind of quote unquote painterly. Gail would, hit, would kill me if she heard me say that this was painterly because it's not, but maybe it is to her, it is to me. Um, but uh, a lot of you guys pulled out Foucault with this, which I thought was cool. A lot of you um, found ways to relate this to Kester as well. And um, so way to go. I was really pleased with that. Um, and I wanted to start off with him because he is a performance artist to a great extent. I mean, he also makes these discrete objects that dance around a space, but the meat or the crux of how he addresses his, his audience is through performance. And so when we're considering performance critically, a good inroad is to look first at performance and then maybe pick it apart, analyze it for its signifiers and its vocabulary, and then begin to apply those signifiers and vocabulary more um, abstractly to other artistic realms, which is what we're, we did this week. Um, and again, all of you have really hit the nail on the head. Uh, Julie Meritu. Julie Meritu is in my head in, with regard to this. It's funny that there's this like flash of light um, Julie Maritou and David Altmed uh, in this cache are one and the same, or they're part of the same question for me. And that question was, what do you do with studio assistants? And I will thank Art21 for putting out in the world a specific subset of videos on assistants, because I was not at all thinking about that when I was looking into Julie. Actually, I was thinking about looking into Julie Maritou's studio because there were some interesting clips. And then I stumbled upon those assistance videos and voila, we have this conversation. <clears throat> now, a lot of you, um, I'm remembering specifically that Shelby, and I'm pretty sure it was also you, Dana, that pointed out the, the very inter interesting, quixotic, uh, problematic, but definitely rhetorical difference in how Julie Maritou refers to her assistants and how Altmed refers to his assistants. And it's so fascinating. So Maritou, in the conversation, she wasn't actually imaged that much in that video, but she's talked about this at length in other videos, in other interviews, um, that they're collaborators. They help her out. They feel the sense of ownership um, and to go back to the conversation that happened in Mickey's studio, that's very much how my experience of people that have worked for Jeff Koons, that's how they feel. They're collaborators. Certainly it's his work and he's idiosyncratic and, and um, uh, very, very, very all about perfection. So he has a different way of running a studio, but it's the, it was in a similar vein as Meritu where it's like, oh yeah, I collaborate on the production of this. I fabricate this. That's my part of the collaboration. I'm the fabricator. Altmed, on the other hand, and there's something that's so poetic about the way he describes this. Um, I can't remember if it's he or his studio assistant that used the word, that the, it's the assistant, where he says that he is the material. Whoa. Hmm. Um, what a funny very sensual way of understanding your role in a place, um, in, in a system. I think it's a, a very quintessentially uh, European way of thinking about it, that your body is enmeshed in another body, as opposed to the very um, kind of Fordian and uh, American way of thinking where we are cogs in a wheel. Um, and the difference there is that one is kind of um, it's more sensual. It's almost a little softer. Uh, it's a little more nuanced according to how, uh, what the, what the need is. Whereas when you're a cog, you have these like sharp movements, angularity, uh, modernism, very much kind of mechanized versus biological. And so there was something that was very sensual and um, almost, like I said, poetic about the way that Altmed's reference was that these are materials. I, I, if I want something to look a certain way, I use that material in the same way that all of you make material choices in your studio. So he's, he's equating it 
in this one way that's very much, as a lot of you pointed out, puts him very concretely in the role of the author. You know, a lot of you brought up Kester, but a lot of you brought up Foucault with this conversation, and um, way to go on that. So, again, collaborators. You brought up Kester when you talked about Meritu, so, um, which was great. And then materials. And then we get to My Barbarian. And these guys, um, the collaboration here is, is uh, and a lot of you have pointed this out, it, in through their appropriation, they're collaborating with people that they cannot physically collaborate with. Um, and I don't even know if physically is the right word. And what do I mean by that? Well, by reading Pedro's words, they conjure Pedro into this place. And I mean, this film wasn't produced before we lost Jose, Dr. Dr. Jose Esteban Munoz, pardon me, um, but we lost him fairly recently. And so again, by the articulation of his words in this video uh, to articulate anyone's words is to give them a little bit of agency after they are after they're gone and this notion that you can do that with any book i mean i'm looking over at my bookshelf here i have lots of books lots of them are by dead people and i can pick them up and by articulating their words i'm essentially as i said uh, the word conjure is really good here um, i'm conjuring them into a certain kind of existence um, and the other fascinating thing, if you think about materialism at its farthest reaches, is brain chemistry is um, actual stuff. Like there is, there's matter in your brain that is making things happen. And so when you remember someone that has passed, uh, you're actually giving them a little bit of a material presence on the planet. The act of remembering someone physically in the tiniest, 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 most molecular sense, but it physically brings them back. It's such a wonderful thing to think about. And in this film, I mean, I, I'm a huge fan of My Barbarian. I was a huge fan of the real world back in its good old days, and I'm a, still a huge fan and um, in great debt to Dr. Munoz um, for the work that he's done. And what a, I mean, lots of very, sharp political commentary is embedded in this work, but um, for me, there is something very soft, again, about this project. But I think that could have a little bit to do with this project, where I actually have a little bit of a personal affinity, not only for this work, um, but for Serge. Um, I was in residence with Serge at Flux Factory when we presented, uh, and I say we because I was part of it when we presented Yoga La La. So I'm going to hop from this thing to another thing, and I'm going to pause for one sec. Okay, so um, A, all of you really did a great job. Again, I'm just going to keep singing your praises um, until you mess it up. Uh, all of you did a really great job in researching what this was. This was my curveball. This was me seeing how um, adeptly you can find access to conversations about contemporary art, how um, all, all of you went right right to the sources, you figured out things, you read what he was saying, um, and the thing that is the best, the most telling, is that so many of you, I'm sure, have so many questions about what the hell you, this project is, what is Yoga Lala, um, but your ability to just push past those insecurities and present information, just facts, like you just gave me facts, this is what this is, this it has something to do with loss, it's, it's, uh, they're on an island, it's a plane crash. You just gave me facts and you left them there. And that's a really, really, really good thing to do because the other option is to not give me anything and that doesn't work and it doesn't give you the benefit of seeing if your information is accurate. So. Um, have a read through what your classmates have said and uh, to that end, but I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what happened on this Thursday night when Serge made that video. So um, Flux Factory is a big building in Long Island City that houses illegally about 15 people um, 
and living there was very hard to do um, for a lot of reasons, and I can talk about them uh, at length with you if you have questions. But uh, every month on the third Thursday, we would have what we called Flux Thursdays, where there was a big potluck that was open to the public, and then House members came together in small committees, um, and so basically three people came together to, form, to work on this project, and you plan an evening of events in the house. You can show movies, you can have lectures, you can do whatever you want. And um, this project, this Flux Thursday night, came, uh, came to me and Serge Stefan and Jimmy Reardon uh, with all of these rules. Like you gotta have dinner. They got people have to come in this way. You have to end by this point. You should start by this point. Like there were all these parameters over this stuff, and we didn't want to have anything to do with it. And so we decided we were going to completely change everything. And Serge came to us and said, "I've got this great idea. It's called Yoga La La. It's a project I started at uh, between an art fair and Paris, an art fair not in Paris, and an art fair in Paris. And it, this is it. Da 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 da. Explains the whole thing. It works." cool, let's do that. In the meantime, Serge is also carpeting half of our gallery in this um, co-op space. So uh, the first thing that happened is people, all very accustomed to coming to these Flux Thursday events, walked into the front door and they would come with potluck and they would all, everyone would bring booze and someone at the house would just take this, all this stuff from them and escort them into this room where this man is reciting uh, a Baudelaire poem that he has translated himself. His name's Frank. He's a very meek, and um, he's just kind of a weirdo. Oh, hang on. Wait a minute. Whoa. Whoa. Is that what I meant to do? There's another one, Frank. Frank from behind. Um. So what would happen next is people would come in and they would sit down at our kitchen table. We would invite them up at small increments, uh, parties of eight, and we would give them food that looked really, really strange. We took all the plates that they brought to the door and we rearranged them. And so people showed up bringing, um, let's say, tuna salad. And then they sat down at, for dinner and they're given a tiny bit of tuna salad, a tiny bit of jello mold that me and Jimmy were making. Um, we just played. It was all about in the in the good spirit of having a grand old Dadaist time. By the way, I think I'm a, I'm confirming that I'm a Dadaist these days. Uh, so these are the, uh, small parties, very small parties. Really gross food, horrible food. And then people went down and enjoyed Yoga Lala, and this is the stuff that I actually wanted to show you because out of the whole night. Um, this was the most successful thing that happened. And so you hear people were asked to come in with these large sheets of paper and do certain initial stretches that would kind of get their bodies warmed up and then make drawings. And then you can see there's uh, the ref uh, camera is shooting out. Uh, it's projecting on the wall, but th so there's a camera that's actually um, recording this event, excuse me, and broadcasting it on the wall right there. And the thing about Yoga Lala, because it's topsy-turvy and it's all about nonsense, is you had to come in and actually put your shoes above your head. And the reason why Serge asked you to do this is because the you were levitating. And so if you saw the bottoms of your shoes, they, you, they, were, they were above you, which means that, some, that you were levitating. Um, Serge, in this very wonderful, buoyant, French way just gets you to believe things when you're talking to him. So you're just like, yes, totally, Serge. I get it. Yeah, levitating. Soul's my feet. Um. <laughs> Sounds like a good time, right? Um. So people just kind of rolled around on this huge carpet. And the act of having the carpet 
was in service of Serge's idea. The act of the, the whole construction of this project were, was all in the service of what Serge wanted the, the group to do. But the group also had a lot of fun. Um, this is my friend Kim, who helped, who's instrumental in helping me work on the Here Here project, um, which is another, uh, which is the next project we're going to talk about. But um, people had fun. There was a reward for participating. There was a reward for being there and um, and enjoying yourself. And so uh, it's very much in line with Kester because I think this work. Um, and I was thinking about this as I was experiencing it. It's, it was so dialogical. It was so give and take. I took and and was given. It was just this wonderful um, kind of symbiosis. And then, um, actually, pause. And I just really am fascinated and in love with how he took what was essentially a scrap carpet that he produced at Flux Factory that was in that video and it was built entirely from scraps that he was able to um, glean off of this nonprofit organization and then to turn it into something that was actually probably made from in the same fashion from just cheap off cast of carpeting but it looks so so good I mean like yeah way to go Serge I'm really happy to see that this project has continued because I still feel like I have some sort of part in it, but I'm also surprised to see new iterations of it. I certainly participated when it was in my home, but now seeing this exhibition that exists on the other side of the world, on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean, gives me uh, this kind of, um, it just feels really good to, because the project feels alive. And so I feel like I'm having a dialogue with something that feels alive. I think that's the best way to say it. And then Janine Olsen. Um, so that woman that I showed you, Kim, she get, sent me a text message one day and said that I have a friend who is in a jam and they need some help um, on this date. Can you, can you help out? And I had met Janine at a birthday party or something and was kind of into it, um, into the idea of helping, helping her out. In some capacity, I had no idea what her work was about at all. <clears throat> and in the same way that my participation within this project was so minuscule, it's like the, it was so tiny, but the reward of having participated was such a nice thing to have. Um, this is the installation shot of some of the set pieces as they were installed at the new museum. Um, there was a project where um, audience members were uh, costumed in quintessential opera costuming garb. And so there were a few roles from a few signature operas um, that we had built the costumes for. And so the audience wore them and then real opera singers came on, performed the songs in plain clothes. And there was this lovely interaction that happened. And I was dressed up as a hunchback. And it was funny and, and really warm. And, um, and Sarah, your comment that the participation of this project totaled out at a family was such a sweet way for me to reminisce about my participation in this project because I've I've become better friends with Janine. I've become also really good friends with a few other people that I worked with on the project. And I was there for, for one night. Like it was just such this like, oh, art, art wins. We win because we're art. Um, and uh, so as far as the participatory aspects of it or the authorship aspects of it, um, I'm going to just say, Go ahead and read through your classmate stuff. I do want to keep this under a half an hour, and I'm at 29 minutes. So I'm just going to say um, way to go and uh, keep up the good work, and I'll see you in a day or so.